Uh, four weeks ago, <clears throat> two episodes ago of The Apologetics, I presented a case in which uh, a case for the conclusion that the word Helkuo or Helko in John 644 translated draws has no room within its semantic domain for a meaning like uh, invite or enable that does not affect a change. Um, my argument was that when it ha is used uh, transitively with a direct object, it consistently in all the relevant literature means to affect a change of position. Well, a few days ago, my friend and colleague Leighton Flowers uh, produced a response video um, in which he attempted to rebut my case. The question that we're going to ask on today's episode of The Apologetics is, does his rebuttal succeed? Let's go. This is Chris Date, and welcome to The Apologetics, where every other week I discuss a wide variety of theological issues and show how a properly biblical worldview can help defend the historic Christian faith from its critics. Join me as we think through what we believe and why we believe it, and not something else. Now, it's at this point in my stream where I usually cover some housekeeping stuff, um, but I've got a lot of content to cover today. It's going to be probably a bit of a long episode. In fact, it's possible it may be one of two parts, depending upon how far I get in the next hour and a half. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. And, um, you know, all the youtube -y stuff I'd appreciate um, you doing for me. So... Uh, a couple of episodes ago, I started what is now a three-part series, if you will, um, not intentionally so, but a three-part series uh, discussing the topic of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. And in that episode, two, uh, two episodes ago, four weeks ago, um, I covered uh, a topic that had to do with two of the five points of Calvinism, total depravity and irresistible grace. I looked at John 644, in which Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I looked at the Greek word um, helkuo, translated draws here. And the reason that I focused on that word is because I played a clip uh, that I thought represented um, a phenomenon that I've seen in the Calvinism, non Calvinism debate on the part of critics of my view, critics of Calvinism. Um, I played a short clip from a debate in which Leighton Flowers um, asks his opponent in the debate, why do you assume effectuality on the word draw when the word enable doesn't assume effectuality? And so I sought to answer this, this question in that episode. Can Helkuo refer to an action that doesn't affect a change, like an invite or an enable type of meaning? And so what I did was I looked at five uh, increasingly expansive, but also increasingly distant uh, layers of contemporaneous literature, um, intending to uh, find out, in, in, intending to answer that question, was there any room in the um, semantic domain of Helkuo for a meaning like invite or enable. And what I concluded after going through the Gospel of John, the rest of the New Testament, Josephus, the Septuagint, and Philo of Alexandria, what I concluded is that no, there is no room in the semantic domain of Helkuo in New Testament koine for a meaning like invite or enable that does not imply an affected change. Well, as I mentioned in the cold open to this episode, um, Leighton Flowers has responded, and we're going to look, in that, uh, look at that response. This was published on his YouTube channel just a few days ago, I believe. Um, the title of it is John 644. Is it an effectual and unconditional drawing of God? And at the time that the video was published, the thumbnail looked like what was on the screen there. But for some reason uh, or another, maybe it's because either my name or my face um, is not uh, a good look for his thumbnail, he switched to this thumbnail. Or maybe his media crew did, I don't know. Um, but anyway, that's if you see two different thumbnails depending upon where it's been posted or whatever, that's why. 
So this is the video that we're going to um, address today. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, it's an hour and 15 minute long video. I'm not going to respond to it all, but I am going to respond to a lot of it. So, and we're going to be getting into some weeds. We're going to be um, criticizing Dr. Flowers a little bit. Uh, and so buckle up. Um, if you end up having to leave before we get done today, just come back and watch the rest later. And as I said, if it, 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 so what, what I think is that this will probably be about two hours worth of content that will be going through well, two hours of streaming today. Um, if about an hour and a half in, it doesn't look like I'm approaching that two hour mark, then I will just cut it off and treat it as a part one. Uh, and then I will continue part two next episode. So without further ado, Let's go ahead and jump right in with what is probably going to be on most people's minds as far as uh, what I might have to say in response to Dr. Rebuttal's, or, uh, Dr. Flowers' um, rebuttal. So here we go. Sometimes he might not think of me as being very serious. Be Whoops, sorry, let me try that again. Sometimes he might not think of me as being very serious because I'm not maybe as in depth and uh, careful as he is. Um, and uh, but uh, he can't say that I'm, I'm not trying to be serious or, or that I ignore him. I have meticulously gone through many of his arguments. I may not always be persuaded by his arguments, but that doesn't mean I'm not serious or uh, willing to engage, which is a, kind of a passing comment. He he uh, kind of threw out there in a, in a recent episode. Yeah, it did hurt my feelings. I'll, I'll, I'll be really honest, Chris. It did hurt my feelings a little bit because I really have tried to engage your arguments well. Maybe I'm not at the, the level uh, of the scholars that you mentioned from Dillard's, but um, I am trying. Uh, and so to, to insinuate that I'm not serious or I'm not really uh, seeking to engage your arguments, I think it's a bit unfair, just, just saying. So this is something that colors the whole rest of his video. Um, and I can understand why. Um, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, Leighton. I care about you deeply, and I didn't want to cause you pain. And I knew as I was saying what I was saying, uh, in, as far as what you're referring to, I knew as the words were coming out of my mouth that this was something that would um, hurt your feelings. And so um, for the fact that your feelings were hurt, I do apologize, Leighton. But that having been said, I stand by what I said, and we'll talk about why here in a moment. One one clarification, though, this was not a passing comment, um, although it would have appeared that way to Leighton if he wasn't um, following the live chat, and I wouldn't expect him to. So I'm not at all blaming Leighton for this, but it wasn't a passing comment. What had happened was that I was in the episode two weeks ago, not four weeks ago, which is the one he's responding to, but the one two weeks ago, in which I was responding to a a video by Dan Chapa and uh, Turret and Fan, whom I'm debating on the topic of hell in a week, by the way. Um, in that episode, I praised Dan Chapa and another non-Calvinist critic of Calvinism and friend named uh, David Paulman, who works at Dillard's, as has, infamous, has become infamous over recent months. Um, I, I was praising them because uh, I considered them to be very to take this serious this issue very seriously, um, and therefore be the two people I consider to be uh, to have a chance of changing my mind here is what I said. Oop. Now, in that stream, a friend of mine, an, an Armenian Molinist by the name of Dan Chapa, um, he tuned in for the first part of the stream. He had to leave, and then um, uh, and then he came back and watched it later. Uh, but but when I saw him in the stream, I mentioned that he, uh, not only that he's a friend, but that I consider him very astute. I have a great deal of admiration and respect for him, and that remains true uh, to this day. In fact, I am, for the time being anyway, um, I, I think that there are two non-Calvinist uh, critics of Calvinism that I think have even the slightest chance of possibly one day uh, convincing me to abandon Calvinism. One of them is Dan Chapa, uh, the person who I mentioned was in the stream that day. The other one, in case you're curious, is David Pullman, um, despite the fact that he uh, works for a uh, clothing store as opposed to uh, being a professor. I, nevertheless, he is one of the two people. And the reason why Dan Chapa and David Pullman have a better chance of convincing me to leave Calvinism than anybody else, in my estimation, at the present time, is because they 
unlike anyone else, to a degree unlike anyone else, any other critic of Calvinism, that is, they actually engage our arguments meaningfully. They hear them. They listen to them. They try to understand them. Um, and they interact with them. And, and more than that, they also acknowledge um, when their previous positions might be mistaken. So that's what I said. I, that's what I said about my friends Dan Chapa and David Pullman. Uh, I meant what I said, and what I meant by saying that they are serious interlocutors on this topic is exactly what I said there. They interact with the arguments um, not just haphazardly, but meaningfully, carefully. They take the time to understand what's being said, and they offer thoughtful responses. Now. It was at this time in that stream that I happened to look at the chat and saw somebody say, what about Leighton Flowers? And when I saw that, um, I finished what I was saying and then I said uh, the following. Um, but no, late, I'm sorry, as, with as much love as I have for Dr. Leighton Flowers as my friend, as my colleague, um, I don't think that he really seriously engages us Calvinists. And Leighton, if you hear me say that, I'm sorry if that hurts, but I'm just being honest. I don't think that Leighton Flowers really takes our argument seriously. And so he really doesn't have a chance, um, it seems to me, of convincing me. That doesn't mean he's a bad guy. It doesn't mean he's a bad scholar. It just means that he is, in my estimation, um, not somebody that's likely to persuade me because he doesn't seriously engage our, our arguments or our, or even our position at times. You see what I, by take, by, by serious, I don't mean just interact with every argument we make. What I mean is deal meaningfully with them, hear them, consider them, interact with them meaningfully. Um, and I don't think that Leighton does that. I think I think David Pullman and Dan Chapa are um, unique in this debate on, well, frankly, both sides of the debate, both the non-Calvinist and Calvinist side. And they, are, they are largely unique in that I think that they are truth seekers. They, they, yes, they believe they have the truth on this topic, or at least something closer to it than what I believe, but they also understand that they're plausibly wrong. I think they they would they would say yes it's plausible that we're wrong. And so they enter they engage in this dialogue in this debate with Calvinists like me not merely or even primarily in an effort to defend their existing view but even more than that to find out if perhaps the truth is somewhere closer to my view. I think they genuinely do that. Now, I don't think a lot of people on my side of the debate do that, but I do think I do. I don't think Leighton does. Leighton, I don't think that you are in this dialogue, in this discussion, to seek the truth. I think you are in this discussion to defend your view at all costs. And I know that probably hurts that I think that of you, and you may very well have the same impression of me, in which case we can leave it to um, our observers, people observing our dispute, to decide for themselves whether um, whether you're, if you suspected that of me, you're right, or whether, given that I suspect that of you, I'm right. We'll leave that to them. But that's going to be what the rest of this episode is largely a demonstration of, I think, is that you aren't, you aren't seriously, carefully engaging in our arguments. You're not hearing them. You're not trying to understand them. You're not interacting with them meaningfully. And you are throwing mud at the wall, hoping that some part of it sticks. That's the impression I get. And I think that's reflected in the clips that we're going to be looking at today. So... Again, I do apologize that that opinion that I expressed hurts. It wasn't, I, I, although it seemed to you, Leighton, and understandably so, to have been out of the blue, just sort of random off the cuff. It wasn't. It was a response in context of something that I was saying to a somebody that said something in the chat. Um, I wasn't just going to throw it out there haphazardly. I, I, I was responding. But it nevertheless, it did hurt you. And that for that, I, I'm sorry. But I stand by what I said. And um, what I just got done is explaining is the reason that I said what I said. So let's now look at um, 
something like 30 clips or 20 clips something like that from the episode that i just played a clip from uh of Layton's show and we'll just go through them one by one and the majority of these i think will demonstrate the point that i just tried to articulate let's go um nevertheless i do want to try to give him a hearing in this particular broadcast um and and i could possibly accuse chris of not being serious with regard to um really engaging with my particular belief because um, as I made the point in the debate with uh, Gabriel Hughes is not only do the Calvinists have the burden to prove that the word drawing there is effectual, but they also have to demonstrate that it's unconditional. In other words, that the reason God is drawing somebody is unconditional because he unilaterally picks somebody before the foundation of the world and he's unconditionally drawing them. Now, this is probably the biggest of the points that I made, and yet was virtually unaddressed by Chris Date. So notice that what Leighton is saying is that actually he could accuse me of not being the serious one because I didn't interact with part of his case, what he considers to be the more important point that he made in that debate. And in fact, he will go on in this video to um, to say that I said what I was doing was critiquing the debate. Here's where he said that. Provision, but both of us seem to agree that had they listened and learned from the Father, in other words, had they listened to Moses, had they listened and learned from the Father and believed in the Father prior to Christ's coming, then they would have come to the Son. Okay? So what really is our theological difference? According to my debate, which Chris says he's critiquing, but yet he's I didn't cover any of this as far as I know. So the question is, did I say anywhere in the episode that he's responding to or in the thumbnail or anywhere that what I was doing was interacting with his debate, interacting with his position, um, uh, critiquing his debate? And the answer is no. I said no such thing. The title of my episode, as reflected on the thumbnail here, was Can Hell Kuo Mean invite or enable that was the only thing that i sought to do in this video was to answer that question um here is a video a, a clip from the video he's responding to um that i've compiled from three places in that video one was a cold open and then two others were from later in the video to give you an idea of what i was going for in that video and why in john 6 44 jesus says no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, Calvinists like me think that this is pretty straightforwardly understood as meaning that human beings are incapable of coming to Jesus in saving faith unless the Father moves them to him. Uh, Non-Calvinists, however, um, offer a number of different other explanations, some of which trade on the notion that the word translated draws here in John 6, 44 can mean something like invite or enable, something that does not affect a change of position, but does enable a change of position somehow or invite a change of position somehow. Do, is, is that true? Is, it, is that assumption that is leveraged by many non-Calvinist interpretations of John 6.44, does that claim hold up? Does the word translated draws in six, John 6.44, um, does it in fact include within its range of possible meanings, meanings like invite or enable? That's a question we look at and look at in today's episode of The Apologetics. Now, in English, the, the word draw has a wide semantic range, and sometimes it means some, something like attract in, 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 a very, in, a, in a very psychological sense, not necessarily a magnetic sense, um, a kind of drawing that doesn't necessarily affect a change of position. It's, it's more like a, a, a force pulling at them, but it may or may not be effectual, right? It may or may not affect the change. But even though the English word has that kind of concept within its semantic domain, it's not clear to us Calvinists that the Greek word translated draws does. And so that's what we're going to look at today, is the, the, the we're going to have a very laser focus uh, to, to use the language of, I think it's Michael Medved, we're going to focus like a laser beam on this word draws. You see, this is um, drawn not in, in any loose sense within the semantic range of 
draw, the English word draw, that doesn't, that's not what this word appears to mean. It appears to us Calvinists anyway to mean in John 66. It seems to mean something more like drag, to affect a change of position from one place to another. But non-Calvinists sometimes disagree with us on that specific point. And it's those who disagree with us on that specific point that I want to respond to. And to kick us off with our response to us, to non-Calvinists, I want to turn to a recent debate between Calvinist Gabriel Hughes and my non-Calvinist friend and colleague Leighton Flowers. This was a debate back in January on Marlon Wilson's The Gospel Truth YouTube channel. And here is part of that exchange. So you can see, I, 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 uh, pitched in my in my thumbnail and in the title a video that was going to have a focus on the word helkuo and whether it can mean invite or enable i explained that in the cold open in the um uh, as i was leading into the topic i explained i was going to be focusing like a laser beam to quote what i keep thinking is michael medved um and then i said here is what uh, here is the first definition in bdag of the word hell kuo and this is what we calvinists think that it means everywhere something along these lines but i said some non-calvinists disagree with us on that specific point and then i gave leighton flowers as an example See, this was never about an interaction with his whole position. This was never about an attempt to prove that we Calvinists are right in contradistinction to his view. This was not a review of his debate. It was nothing like this. Yes, it, yes the provisionist perspective, this is a response to Flowers' response. So it was none of those things. See, the what one of the things I try to do as a scholar is to advance the field to to uh, I, I saw a, a meme once that I thought was really um, was really helpful. It was a meme that tried to illustrate uh, what the role of a PhD is. And they said, you know, they had this circle that was like here. Let's say this is the full set of human knowledge. And then it said in the undergrad in an undergrad and then it zooms in to a, a large arc on that circle this is the part of that human knowledge that you cover in your undergrad and then in the master's or graduate degree it zooms in even closer into just a little tiny part of the arc and it said this is where you're at in your master's degree and then in your phd it zooms super in close and you just you just put a little divot, an outward facing divot in the circle, meaning in your PhD, you are adding to humankind's collective body of knowledge. And only a little tiny bit compared to the full scope of human knowledge. And that's very much how I see myself wanting to contribute to this debate. Not by simply rehashing everything that's already been said, but by covering things that I think aren't being covered well in the debate. And so, yes, Greg, I am going to be talking about the second point in BDEG. So, um, so in this, so the reason why I did this video that were the, uh, the one that the one to which Leighton is responding is because I have on many occasions seen non-Calvinist critics, um, offering the concept of inviting or enabling some kind or wooing some kind of pulling that doesn't affect a position some kind of force that doesn't affect a position and saying that's what draw means and and i don't hear calvinists doing a good job of addressing that so i wanted to put that little tiny divot i wanted to push outward on the on the full body of calvinist non-calvinist debates push outward on it and add a little bit more content to that debate that hasn't already been covered to death and so i and so i focused like a laser beam on the meaning of Helkuo in john 6 44 answering the question whether or not um it can mean invite or enable in john 6 44. It had nothing, and, and I used Leighton simply as an example because he is one of the four, one of the most well-known, popularly anyway, um, defenders or, or uh, critique critis, critics of Calvinism out there, and so that's why I used his debate. This had nothing to do with an interaction with his whole position or a critique of his debate or anything like that. But going back to what I said about not considering Leighton a serious interlocutor on this topic, did. Was there any indication that he, he there, I gave, I gave no indication in my video that that's what I was doing with Leighton was, was critiquing him or his view or, or critiquing his debate. 
But that's what he makes throughout multiple times in his video. We're going to play another one a little bit later. He 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 uh, repeats this point that somehow I'm ignoring the more important point and focusing only on the weaker one, in, and and and, and alleging me of saying I'm critiquing his debate when I wasn't. So that's one example of him not being a serious interlocutor. Um, let me return to my slides and move on to the next clip. But even though the English word has that kind of concept within its semantic domain, it's not clear to us Calvinists that the Greek word translated draws does. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so if English, the English word draw has that limitation because it has a range of meaning that is broader than the Calvinist like, then why has every translator used the word draw? Why not use the word compel? In other words, if the word compel is a better English word, then why don't any of the translations use the word compel? So notice what he's implying. He's implying that a, a, a good faithful translation will translate the source word, in this case the Koine Greek word helkuo, into a destination word, in this case the English word draw, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat that doesn't seem to want to pay any attention to the video. Anyway, um, he seems to be thinking that you need to, that, that, that a good translation will translate the source word into a destination word that has the exact same semantic domain, such that if there's ambiguity in the English word, there must likewise be ambiguity in the Greek word. But it, but that's, but that's not how translation works. And I'll give you two examples of it in the scriptures itself. So here is the English word great. All right. And the English word great, according to dictionary.com, which is, of course, uh, I think they, they get their definitions from Merriam-Webster or something like that. But nevertheless, it's not like an Oxford English dictionary, but nobody is going to dispute what I'm about to say, which is that, yes, the word great has within its semantic domain where I was, don't worry, Skylar, I was not talking about you. I was talking about somebody else. Um, and I wasn't talking about anybody else except for the person I was talking about. <laughs> and they don't think that they, that I'm talking about them and I am. Anyway, the English word great has in its semantic domain words like unusually large, numerous, you know, considerable in degree, power, intensity, the kinds of words that would be, or, or well, that, well, that's one aspect of the semantic domain, right? One kind of meaning within its semantic domain. But notice that the English word also has in its range of meanings, the, the word great, wonderful, very good, first rate. All right. So we see in the English word great, a semantic domain that includes both Mon, um, uh, magnitude, like size, as well as um, wonderfulness, very goodness. So then, theoretically, if we find a word translated great in the Bible, that Greek or Hebrew word underneath the surface must also have both kinds of meanings in its semantic domain, right? Well, let's take a look. Genesis 1.16, and God made the two great lights. The word is gadol. You can see it here in red. It's gadolim because it's um, plural. Um, God made the two great lights. Well, here's the thing. It, it, great here is talking about that um, magnitude, that uh, that enormity, the, the big lights in the sky, right? It's, it's about largeness. So that fits one of those two categories of meaning in the semantic domain of the English word great. But the word gadol never means very good or wonderful. It's a word that connotes magnitude. And the great in English can also connote magnitude, but it also connotes or can connote very good or wonderful, a meaning that is not in the semantic domain of gadol. So by Leighton's reasoning, the myriad translations, and by the way, there's a ton of them, um, the NASB, the ESV, the NIV, the NLT, the RSV and NRSV, the KJV and NKJV, the CSB and HCSB, the LEB, the NET, the ASV, the DRB, they all use the word great. But by Leighton's reasoning, because the Hebrew word gadol has a narrower semantic domain than the English word great, well, then they're doing a piss poor job of translating. Or how about the word star? 
In English, there are several uh, sub meanings along the lines of heavenly bodies like stars and the sun and the moon and uh, well maybe not the moon but heavenly bodies the glowing heavenly bodies but the word star can also refer to a person's destiny or fortune or temperament it can also refer to a prominent actor singer or the like like a celebrity so by Leighton's reasoning if we find a word translated star in the bible that must be a word that includes within its semantic domain meanings like destiny fortune temperament or actor singer or celebrity right well, in Acts 27, 20, when neither sun nor stars, astron is the word. Here it's astron because it's plural, but astron is the word. And as you can see here again, tons of English translations render this star. Well, so astron should have within its semantic domain something like celebrity or something like destiny or fortune, right? But it doesn't. Ostron never has the meaning of fortune or famous person. The, those are meanings that are um, within the semantic domain of English, but not the semantic domain of Ostron. You see, translation doesn't require that the word you translate to has the exact same semantic domain as the word that you're translating from. Translation is about taking a word in its original, taking the word's original meaning and capturing its meaning there with a word that captures its meaning there in the destination language, regardless of what other meanings that word in the destination language might have. So this argument that somehow I'm, by, by pointing out or by arguing that Helkuo has a narrower semantic domain than the English word draw, but by suggesting that that somehow means that the English word should be something other than draw is just, it's not serious. It's not serious. It's throwing mud at the wall and hoping some of it sticks. And by the way, another reason why we wouldn't use something like compel for the word helkuo is because since the word is used for both objects and persons, and we're going to come to that too, because it's used with both kinds of objects and with similar meanings in both cases, the the impetus the motive the, the the instinct in translation is to try to find a word that can equally apply in both cases but the word compel does not make sense with swords nets etc with objects you don't compel an object you might compel a person but you don't compel an object so the idea that i should be using compel is just ridiculous and the, and, the, and the idea that somehow the English translation ought to have the exact same semantic domain as the source language is, is just not serious. Uh, next clip. Th this is what I'm going to invoke a little bit of what Brian Wagner said when we talked about this, is that we do believe that when God draws, there is an affected change of position. Um, it's, it's like every evangelist you've ever heard out there, if you've done street evangelism or you've, you've listened to an evangelist preach, uh, to, and he, they would say, to, to not decide is to decide. So what are they saying? You, you now have no excuse. You are now in a different position than you were before because now you know the truth. So if you didn't know the truth, then you wouldn't be accountable, Jesus says, but now you know the truth. You're in a different position now because now you've been drawn. Now you've been enabled. Now you've been invited. Now you've been informed. Now you have the light and you have to make a decision. You have now come to a fork in the road to where you must choose as to which way you will go. So just to say, and I know what Chris means by to effectuate a change of position, I know what he means by it, but he's, he's very careful with his words and he wants to be very uh, specific. And if he wants to be very specific and accurate, he should say to effectuate a positive change of position in the direction that the drawer or the one drawing in wants or, or is, is causing, or effectuating, right? In other words, it, it can't be just that there's a change of position. It has to be that you're effectuating a change of position um, in, in an effectual way. And of course, we know that's what Chris means. And so I'm, trying, I'm not trying to nitpick him. He may not be trying to nitpick, but he sure is throwing a lot of mud at the wall. So in this case, notice what he's doing. He's saying, well, okay, even if I grant to Chris that Helkuo means to affect the change of position, I can admit it changes affects a change of position in John 6.44. It's just that the position that 
the, the change of position that is affected is either a change of position to Christ or a change of position away from him. But that does not work. See, let's say that the word, instead of being um, come, which is erkamai, probably, uh, yes, erkamai, um, instead of come, let's say the, the verb was move, kineo, here the infinitive kinesi is on your screen. And let's say that all the text said was no one can move unless the Father draws him. Well, if that were the case, if there weren't a stated definition, then yeah, the word draws, theoretically, could be in any direction. He might tip the person over to the left, he might tip the person over to the right. He might draw the person to, um, to Christ, or he might draw the person away from Christ, or whatever the, the destination, um, whatever the destination one might think it could be. But that's not how the text ends. It's also got the prepositional phrase pros me, to me. And when the destination is stated, draws is to that destination. It's to Jesus. Moreover, the word isn't kaleo, uh, sorry, um, kineo, meaning move. It's uh, erchamai, here the infinitive elthane, which means come. And the word come also implies destination. You put, the, you put those two things together, that it's coming and it's to me, the drawing is effectuating a change of position to Christ. They are, and not just in the direction of Christ, but with Christ as the destination to which they're drawn, the position that they are moved to. This idea that somehow it could really just be drawn in any direction or just a little bit of the way to Christ, but not all the way, none of that does not work. This is not a serious rebuttal. Let's continue. And so I make this point and I say, can someone can, notice the word can, not just may, may they come, no. They, can they come to the, the wedding feast unless they're invited? No, they cannot come. They have to have, you cannot enter without an invitation. You have to have an invitation. So it's not just granting people permission to come as he's gonna accuse me of here in a minute. It's, it's you're not enabled to, you don't have the power to, you don't have the ability to come unless you have been invited. So notice that Leighton suggests that because he used the word can rather than may, that it really is about ability rather than um, invitation. But the whole point I was making was that he's equivocating on the word can. See, in English, we use the word can in, in, in common parlance to mean either are able, you know, is able or is permitted. Hey, Mon, can I have a drink? is not a question about ability. It's a question about permission. So the fact, and in fact, in English, <laughs> you even look this up in a dictionary. In English, the word can includes within its semantic domain having permission or right. So the fact that you use the word can, Leighton, does not prove you're talking about ability or inability. That is not a serious response. Moreover, um, if we look at something like the allegedly um, analogous uh, parallel that um, Leighton offered, no man can come to the son's wedding banquet unless the father invites him and he will have a great, fe great feast. First, Leighton tries to suggest that because he used the word can, therefore I'm wrong by saying that he's he's using it in the sense of permitting, which I've just disproven. But secondly, he really doubles down and insists he's talking about ability. But here's the thing, inviting somebody doesn't enable them. It doesn't give them the capacity to do something they didn't previously have the capacity to do. One can sneak into a banquet, theoretically, apart from other factors not being stated. Um, and if what Leighton is suggesting is, yeah, but if one, if one doesn't hear about the invitation or hear about the party, well, then they can't they literally don't have the capacity to go because they don't know about it. Well, but they could find about, they could find out about it from somebody else. Again, inviting does not, um, uh, does not enable somebody to do something they weren't previously able to do. Inviting grants permission. It does not overcome inability. This is this was not a serious response. Let's continue. Um, also, how many times have you heard me quote 
from Romans 10, 14. How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? Not how many may call, like how many need permission to call on the one they believe in? How, how many need permission to believe in one whom they've not heard? Is that what I ever say? No, I say they can't. You can't believe in somebody you don't know exists, can you? No. You can't come to a party you don't know is happening, can you? No, you can't do it. Dunatai, as he mentions, you can't. You, it is a cannot. It's a real cannot. It is impossible. So notice here he puts up a particular translation of Romans 10, 14 and emphasizes the word can that, it, uh, that is used in that translation a couple of times. And notice also that he uses udunatai when referring to it. Okay. Well, let's look at Romans 10, 14. I've got the Greek on top. I've got the English translation from the New International Version that he's quoting from. The hows are in Greek and English colored in um, that really super light green to try to make it stand out. And the cans are colored in dark black to make them stand out. But guess what? There is no language of ability or inability here. The, there is no dunatai or udunatai. The word dunamis isn't here at all. This is, this is Leighton arguing, just like he did in the very video he's responding to. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. I thought I had a slide in here. Um, I may have a slide in what we're about to see coming up. But remember a few clips ago, we played him saying I could accuse Chris of not covering the more important part of the debate. And then I showed you that that was never the point of this video anyway. But then also here, but, but what I, I've got, I thought I had a slide here. Maybe I didn't, but we can come to it later if I do. He didn't in his response even touch where I argued at the end, uh, toward the end of my video that he argues from John 6, 65 and, uh, and argues that um, John 6, 44, that in, John, that in verse 65, Jesus is interpreting himself, explaining what he had meant in verse 44. I critiqued that too, and that was nowhere in his response. So who's the one that's not responding to what they're stating they're responding to? It's not me. But in that um, rebuttal, I pointed out that he was quoting, he was arguing from a particular translation of that, of John 6.65, and it just so happens it was this translation, the NIV. So notice that although he wants to wants to, claims to want to engage in this dialogue seriously, he argues from English translations without doing any research into the original language, or for that matter, consulting other uh, translations. Because here's a better translation, the ESV, how then will they call on him? How, or how are they to believe in him? How are they to hear? See, these are not there is no language of dunamis or dunamai. There is no language of ability. This, these are all subjunctive verbs. They connote potentiality. There's nothing about here. How will they do X if Y doesn't happen? It's not about ability. It's about something will not happen unless this happens first. This is not a serious rebuttal. Let's continue. By the way, Dr. Flowers' line of reasoning, in my estimation, that we just saw in his cross-examination with Gabriel Hughes, would not work against my view because I don't think regeneration is a bringing to life. Okay, so he doesn't think regeneration is bringing to life. That's news to me. Was that really news to you, Leighton? Well, I mean, I suppose you might have forgotten but we've actually had this conversation on more than one occasion. One of those occasions was a year ago. We were discussing it with Robert um, Wiesner before we started streaming my debate with Lou Ruggiero. And here is where you mentioned that pre-stream conversation we had. Absolutely. And I'll give a little teaser here. Uh, b before the debate started, uh, Robert, Chris, and I were discussing briefly uh, the topic of pre-faith regeneration, which as many of you know, I've confronted uh, R.C. Sproul's particular take on uh, regeneration preceding faith. Um, and, and Chris and Robert hold to a little different nuance of that. Um, and they admit that it is a nuance differences. 
Um, and I thought it was a really interesting discussion in the brief moments that we had before this debate. And so I, I mentioned to them maybe having them back on to talk through that. And this is one of the reasons that we oftentimes point out Calvinism is not monolithic, just like Arminianism or provisionism is not monolithic. We have different camps and different ways of understanding. There were several ways in which Lewis interpreted uh, Romans chapter 8 a little differently than I would, or Ephesians chapter 1 a little differently than I would. That's just the nature of free will. And when people have free will, they come to different conclusions. Um, but nevertheless, that, that, that discussion, I think, should be had because I, I really appreciated some of the perspective that they had with regard to the nuanced differences uh, in understanding what regeneration is. So maybe Robert, Chris, uh, we can schedule a time to come back and, and maybe discuss some of those nuanced differences and understanding why a Calvinist doesn't necessarily have to argue for pre-faith regeneration, at least using those exact terms, because of the different nuanced beliefs that may be behind that that particular term. Um, so uh, if, if y'all are game for that, maybe we can schedule to do that at a later time. And there at the very end was me nodding to his suggestion that we cover it in a future episode. So not only did we have the conversation before the stream began a year ago, in which I explained, I don't think regeneration is a coming to life. Um, but also he, and that's a discussion we'd had previously, um, on multiple, on multiple occasions, or at least two, one of which I have this video evidence of. But he also said, he also acknowledges that Robert and I both have nuanced understandings of regeneration, of pre-faith regeneration. He acknowledge, he appreciates, he says, the nuance that we, that we come to this debate with. He also says that, um, that our nuance on this topic is the same kind of variation you see within his side of the debate. But then he says, well, a year later, it's news to me. Come on, this is not this is not a serious response. Sure, you might have forgotten, but let's not let's not make a big big affect. Oh, this is news to me. No, it wasn't. Maybe you forgot, but it wasn't news to you. And I still have not gotten the invitation to have that discussion. I'll be checking my Facebook inbox. But there's more to say on this issue of my nuanced understanding of what pre-faith regeneration is. Uh, he, he seems to have a very, very idiosocratic position, even different from most Calvinists, at least that I'm aware of on that point. And so I, I don't say that to, to say that he can't be right. I'm just saying when you speak with dogmatism about a particular position and your view is very idiosyncratic, you know, you, you have a, you, your burden is even higher than maybe Pastor Hughes's was, because not only do you have to prove your position, you have to prove your position in opposition to almost every other scholar that I'm aware of, at least. But so he says that I shouldn't state my position dogmatically because I hold an extreme minority view. OK, this is not a serious response. See, I have not spoken with dogmatism anywhere, let alone in the video he's responding to, about what regeneration means. I haven't had a chance to. He hasn't invited me on a show to talk about it like he said a year ago he would do. I didn't speak with dogmatism to what regeneration means. So it doesn't matter that I hold a minority Calvinist view on what regeneration is, when it, the, 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 what, what precedes faith. What I spoke with dogmatism about in the episode he's responding to is the meaning of Helkuo in John 6.44, and on that point, Calvinists agree with me across the board. This was not a serious interaction, but let's continue. And here, it does, doesn't get any better. So instead of disqualifying all of the texts that he reads that are about inanimate objects, he, it seems like he, again, maybe it's my bias, I admit that, he seems to hyper-focus on those. He disqualifies a lot of other texts because they're not uh, semantically relevant in his estimation, and I would have some issues with some of those uh, reasons for why they're not semantically relevant, which we'll get into a little bit maybe later. But if anything would disqualify a text from not being relevant would be if it's talking about inanimate objects. <laughs> And instead of leaving those out, he seems to hyper-focus on those. I seem to hyper-focus on those. Really? So anybody who's watched that video knows that all I did 
was go in order through every occurrence of Helkuo or Helko in these five layers of literature. First the Gospel of John, then the rest of the New Testament, then Josephus, then Septuagint, and then Philo of Alexandria. And in every one of those um, bodies of literature, I went through every occurrence of the word in... Um, in canonical order, the order in which the verse appears in that particular document or set of documents. I didn't focus on anything. I just listed them all and went through them one by one in order. That's all. But more than that, you tell me if I hyper-focused on objects. Uh, so I began with John. And yeah, I pointed out that three of the five uses in John are about objects. Okay, then I went to the rest of the New Testament, and guess what? These are persons, not objects. And then I looked at Helkuo in Josephus, and I disqualified all of these because they aren't being used transitively with a direct object. And the, but nevertheless, these are persons, not objects. And then, yes, I looked at some shekels, but I conceded, as we'll talk about a little bit later, maybe in the next clip, I conceded by means of this asterisk in the right column that are effectual, and, and I verbalized it, as I will do in a moment, that these are objects. But then, and, 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 I, and, ex, and I explained why, or I said I'll concede that they aren't as directly relevant to the discussion as other texts. And then I continued in Josephus. And these are persons, not objects. Here's more from Josephus. Again, just going through them in order. And this is a person, not an object. And then I went into the Septuagint, and these are persons, not objects. Continuing in the Septuagint, these are persons, not objects. More in the Septuagint, these are persons, not objects. More in the Septuagint, these are persons, not objects. Philo, these are persons, not objects. More in Philo, 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 persons, not objects. And then, as I said before, these, uh, I, I pointed out that this, these were about persons, but persons can be dragged too. So the fact that they are persons doesn't disqualify, or the fact that objects are dragged doesn't disqualify persons from being dragged either. And as these from Philo and others suggest, psychological drawing can be effectual too. So did I hyper focus on objects? No. There is no legitimate way, no possible way to make that claim seriously. It's just throwing mud at a wall. And besides the objects, even the fact that there were many objects included in the list, because I was listing every single gosh darn use of the word, just because I did that doesn't doesn't mean those objects are, are should be disqualified because persons can be dragged too, and psychological drawing can be effectual too. That was not a serious response, Leighton. Um, he, notice here, the, this is about uh, shekels. It's, it's about inanimate objects. And he's using those as his examples as, as to, to demonstrate how Helco um, must be a compelling or a, an effectual kind of uh, meaning of the terms. So you just saw me go through the list of examples that I used and of the dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of both objects and persons in various literatures, both psychological and physical uh, drawing, four of them were shekels. And Leighton is saying, I'm using that at, to make my case. Well, not only is that on its face absurd, but look at what I said when I covered that specific set of texts. So... Again, we could. Uh, I'm willing to concede. Like I could make my case even stronger by saying that in every single one of these cases, yes, an effective change, an, an effective position. Sorry, a change of position is affected. But in none of these cases is the word being used transitively with a direct object. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna put an asterisk next to not applicable. 
It's not applicable because it doesn't have a direct object. It's got an asterisk because if we treat the subject of the passive verb as a direct object of an active verb, it would be to affect the change of position. We also have four uses um, which I have encountered nowhere else. And it took me a few minutes, it took me a little bit actually, to figure out what was going on here. And then I confirmed it in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, I think, or maybe it was, no, I think that's what it was. <clears throat> I found this interesting thing where, um, <coughs> excuse me, objects were said to weigh, um, and the way translates this word helkuo or helko, and then some amount of precious metal like gold or shekels. And at my first thought was like, okay, the, well, these aren't really applicable. But then what I was able to figure out is that actually these are very much applicable. Um, you see, the way that they would determine that something weighs 200 shekels is by putting 200 shekels on one side of a scale. And then the object they're weighing on the other side of the scale. And if they end up, and, and if, 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 you know, if you've got the shekels down here and you put the object on the scale and it pulls it up, that's how they know it weighs 200 shekels. So it's quite literally drawing, dragging, pulling weight. So yes, here in these uses of the word, it does mean to affect a change of position. And so I'm putting yes in the effect, effect the change column. However, um, I still put an asterisk, asterisk there simply out of concession that it is debatable how applicable these are since they're dealing with a very peculiar use of the word having to do with weighing um, on a scale. All right, so I'm going to say yes, but I'll put an asterisk there. So I explicitly said that this was of questionable applicability to the discussion because of its peculiar use of the language in a very peculiar context. Moreover, I covered those four texts all together at once after a bunch of other verses and before a bunch of other verses. I did not in any way make my case with a focus on objects, let alone a focus on objects on a scale. Okay. Or like Paul and Silas, they're unwilling to go uh, before the tribunal or get stoned with rocks or whatever it is. And so you'd have to drag them, uh, kicking and screaming, so to speak, compelled against their will. Now, what's interesting about that is Calvinists are very quick to say, that's not what's happening in John 6, 44, because they don't want say, to say that people are being physically forced against their will to believe in Jesus or to come to Christ. But what do they say? No, your will is changed. You're regenerated, which Chris doesn't believe this is regeneration. So I don't believe this is regeneration. This is made up out of whole cloth. I didn't say anything remotely close to denying that this was about regeneration. I mean, this, this blows me away. How do you even get that, let alone assert it in a public video without checking to make sure that you understood the person right? Here's what I actually said. By the way, Dr. Flowers' line of reasoning, in my estimation, that we just saw in his cross-examination with Gabriel Hughes, would not work against my view because I don't think regeneration is a bringing to life. I do think regeneration precedes faith. I don't think it's coming to life. But I do think regeneration precedes faith. In the, and it was in the very context of this video, in the very context of the discussion he was Leighton was having with Gabriel Hughes. I do believe in regeneration. I do believe in pre-faith regeneration, I said. I just don't think it's a coming to life. So when Leighton... When you go on your public video without asking me if you understood me correctly, saying, I don't believe that this is regeneration here, that is not a serious interaction. And, and I'm not sure why it is that Chris Date posts this as his example and then goes through his whole dialogue only at the hour and 30 minute mark to finally pull in point two of BDAG so as to refute it, which we're going to see here in just a second. So, 
<laughs> and he says this at multiple points in his response that he just cannot for the life of him understand why I would begin with um, BDAG number one and then spend an hour and 15 minutes exploring the meaning of Helkuo in all of its various uses and then only then after that go to the second meaning in BDAG. Well, let's take a look at the context in which I um, turned to the first definition of BDAG. So what I'm about to play is a, a little bit before I said that, but what I had done by this point was I began with that slide that I showed at the very beginning of this one. No biblical studies and reviews, it's not a common Calvinist view, it's my view. Um, so I began the video with that slide that I began this video with, saying this is what soteriology is, and I explained in the video that I'm trying to make this accessible and educational for people at various levels. And then I walked through the, the um, topics of uh, uh, total depravity and, and total inability and irresistible grace, and then I looked at why we Calvinists think we see that in John 6.44. And then I pointed out that the word draws in John 6.44 is the Greek word helkuo, and then I talked about how it's pronounced and how it's emphasized and how it's transliterated. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing is I'm introducing viewers to the question at hand. I'm not yet making a case for it meaning draw drag in John 6.44. I'm just walking viewers through step by step the prolegomena, if you will, or the the sort of elementary facets of this topic before I go deep. And then I said the following, all right? So we're talking today about the Greek word helkuo or helko, depending upon whether you're talking about its later iterations or its earlier ones. Now, the reason why we Calvinists think that John 6.44 so compellingly teaches our view is because um, while the English word draw does have a wide semantic range, the pretty consistent meaning everywhere we go to in the relevant literature that can inform what it means in the New Testament is something like what the Lo Anita lexicon that I'm quoting here defines it as, to pull or drag requiring force. Um, and, and it's very often translated pull or draw or drag. And it's not just the low, low Anita lexicon, the, the, the more historical, um, gold standard, BDAG, Bauer, Donker, um, Arndt, and Gingrich, um, offers as the first meaning of this word to move an object from one area to another. Um, in fact, the implication is very often that the object being moved is incapable of propelling itself or unwilling to do so voluntarily. So you can see, just simply by listening to that clip, given the context that I just gave you, and you can go watch it yourself to see the context, I had said the reason why we think it means this in John 6.44 is because when we look at everywhere else it's used, what we see is a consistent meaning of drag or draw. And then I gave the low Nita lexicons definitions, both of them, by the way, one having to do with physicality and one not, but both of them being dragging, uh, to show that this is the, the meaning captured by uh, or, or reflected in all the other uses that we see of the word, besides John 644. And then I say, here's another lexicon whose first definition means that too. And then I began my survey of the literature to show that everywhere else it does indeed have these meanings. I wasn't making a case for, I wasn't arguing that the first definition here is believed by the writers of BDAG to apply to John 6.44. I wasn't making a case from this definition listed in BDAG to our understanding of John 6.44. I had simply said everywhere else that we see the word used in all relevant literature, it means something that is reflected in these definitions, in these lexicons. And then I went on to go and establish that by looking at all the relevant literature. I wasn't mis, uh, misrepresenting BDAG. I wasn't doing something um, with some sort of ulterior motive here. I was, again, walking my audience step by step through the, through the elementary uh, steps you've got to go through as you go through this debate. This was not a serious response. And interestingly enough, one of the examples in John 
21, I believe it is, they try to draw a load of fish in and can't because it's too heavy. So it's like trying to pick up the stapler and it's glued to the table. And so I'm trying to draw it and it's not working. It's, it's, it's able to resist, even though it's an animated object for you know physical reasons, obviously, the fish were too heavy. So there's an example of Helco, even with inanimate objects, where it actually fails in doing the intended of the intention of the drawer. Yes, it's true. The word Helcuo is indeed used in this text as and it reflects what the people tried to do. The Greek says Uketi Alta El Helcusai Iskuon. They were not able to haul it in. But notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say they drew it and failed. It says they tried to draw it, or at least it implies that, right? They weren't able to draw it, which implies that they tried to, but it does not imply that they did it and failed. See, that's what Leighton, that's what your case requires, is a text in which somebody draws something, but the person is not, but a change of position isn't affected. What you need is something like, I, I drew him, but he didn't come. And you don't have that here or anywhere else. What you have is they tried to draw, but failed. This was not a serious response. And just because the drawing is psychological doesn't mean it's not effectual. So this second definition in BDAG... Okay, mark down what he said there. Just because the drawing is psychological does not mean it's effectual. Keep that in mind. Does not support an invite or enable reading of John 6.44. Okay, so I would say in response to that, just because the drawing of an inanimate object is effectual doesn't mean the drawing of an accountable person with a free moral will is effectual. And where, anywhere in my stream, could I even be construed as having said that because inanimate objects, when it's draw when they're drawn, a change of position is affected. Therefore, when it's used of persons, it is also. I never said anything even coming close to that, Leighton, and you know it. Moreover, I'll just refresh you again. The other uses of Helcuo that I covered in the New Testament are persons, not objects. Many of these. Um, uh, items that I included from Josephus were persons, not objects. Many of these uh, examples I gave from the Septuagint were persons, not objects. And that's true also of um, Philo. I'm still not done going through the Septuagint yet. Now I'm to Philo. And these are persons, not objects as well. I didn't assume that because it's used to mean affect the change of position for objects, that therefore that's what it must mean by persons. What I demonstrated is that it means that in both cases, both when it's used of objects and when it's used of persons, which leaves no reason, no basis for arguing that it means something, that it doesn't mean a change of position is affected in John 6.44. That was not a serious rebuttal. It was not a serious interaction. You can't just assume you're reading, um, which is, again, why I think BDAG has uh, two two possible choices with regard to, to uh, the semantic use of the word and how it's used. And, and, and Chris Dake disagrees with BDAG. No, I don't. I don't. In fact, by the way, I should have played a little bit more of this clip, a few more seconds, because he says, I should just be honest with you. That really chapped my hide. This was not an honest response. Here is what I said. Now, somebody mentioned way back an hour and 15 minutes ago, roughly, that the second definition um, of Helcuo in Bauer, Donker, Arndt, and Gingrich might support a more enticing, wooing kind of reading. And that's because in BDAG, the second definition of Helcuo is to draw a person in the direction of values for inner life, to draw, to attract. And the one single text that they cite in the New Testament as an example where it means that is the very text we're looking at now, John 6.44. And so you might be inclined to think, well, shoot, maybe, maybe it can mean enable or invite in a way that doesn't necessarily affect a change. Well, no, we've just seen that the word has no room in its semantic range for that. And by the way, 
this definition doesn't say attract in a way that may or may not be resisted. It doesn't say attract in a way that might affect the change, but also could be resisted and therefore not affect the change. No. It just says that the attraction or the drawing is psychological, it's emotional, it's spiritual rather than physical. And just because the drawing is psychological doesn't mean it's not effectual. So this second definition in BDAG does not support an invite or enable reading of John 6.44. It just means that the drawing, the dragging, the compulsion isn't physical, it's psychological. See, far from disagreeing with BDAG, I'm affirming BDAG. What I'm pointing out is that just because this second definition offered by BDAG points out that the drawing is psychological rather than physical doesn't mean that it's a, a drawing that can fail or that or that they can draw and they may, and it may or may not affect the change. I wasn't disagreeing with BDAG. I wasn't misleading anybody on BDAG. I was affirming BDAG. I was rebutting people that try to claim that the second definition is a resistible drawing or is a kind of drawing that doesn't affect a change. And I'm just pointing out, it doesn't say that. It just says that the drawing is psychological or inward or emotional. And as I pointed out in the survey that I did, psychological drawing still affects a change in the literature that uses the word. Again, this is not how a serious interlocutor rebuts someone. So the, the clear indication, it seems to me, but the base reading of this text is that God desired something for them as being patient, bearing with them. The word helco is used in the sense that he's drawing with them or patient with them or longing with them, wanting them to come. And just look at this particular translation. This is the CSB, but you can even go to the ESV, which is, um, you know, usually, oh goodness, not sure why it's refusing to connect. But anyway, the, the ESV says he's patient with them or he bore with them with great patience. All of them say basically the same kind of, of vernacular. Not one of them, not even one translation says anything remotely close to what you're about to hear Chris date suggest that this text actually means. This was one of the least serious things that Leighton said in his response. You see, what he's just done is he's, he's, he's referring to where in my video I offer um, uh, a, tra a possible translation of the Septuagint rendition of Nehemiah 9.30. The Septuagint, as even Leighton knows, is not the Bible from, uh, from which all the translations he just mentioned are translated. The Septuagint was a Greek translation and oftentimes interpretation, even commentary, of the Hebrew Masoretic text. The Hebrew Masoretic text, well, that's not even accurate. The Masoretic text is from a thousand years after Christ because it's got the Masoretes in it. But the Hebrew is the point. The Septuagint translators were translating the Hebrew. And the Hebrew is that upon which the, all those English translations that he pointed out are based on. I didn't challenge a translation of any of those. I didn't offer a competing translation of any of those. What I offered a competing translation of was a translation of the Septuagint rendition of Nehemiah 9.30. Saying that my translation looks nothing like the CSB, the NIV, the NLT, the ESV, or the NASB, etc., 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 is completely irrelevant. 100% indisputably, undeniably, wholly irrelevant. I was offering a translation of the Septuagint Greek, not the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, there are two or three somewhat popular English translations of the Septuagint out there, and they all are translated very similarly to the ones that, um, that uh, Leighton just mentioned. So he could say that, yeah, I've offered a translation that you won't find in the two or three other translations of the Septuagint, which, by the way, aren't anywhere near as um, carefully done and seriously done as the major translations of the Hebrew Bible. 
What I mean by that is with, with ESV, with NASB, with all these other translations, you have a committee of scholars working diligently and over time from version to version of that translation to come up to, to render a, a proper English translation of the Hebrew. But in the case of tran English translations of the Septuagint, you have a person, one person translating the Septuagint. Ralph, um, Brenton, there are, there are two or three names. So the fact that I am one of, you know, one among three or four single individually done translations of the Greek Septuagint does not mean that mine is way out to lunch or out in left field or something like that. This was not a serious interaction with me. But I'll add that actually one English translation of the Hebrew actually does capture something very similar to what I'm saying. What the translation that I argued, or the translation that I offered of the Septuagint rendition of, he, of Nehemiah 930, um, traded on there being a direct object of draws other than them. I had pointed out that this doesn't say, the Hebrew doesn't say in the Greek and the Septuagint doesn't say that they were drawn. It says you drew with them. And so I, and then I pointed out that in the Septuagint, there is the words many years are in the accusative and could possibly be the direct object of draws. Well, in the NET, a very well-respected scholarly transla translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, they rightly recognize that them is not the direct object of prolonged, which is here what translates the Hebrew word uh, to which Helkuo corresponds in the Septuagint. And notice what they have is as prolonged, your kindness. You won't find that in any of those translations that he pointed out, except NET. Why? Well, if you look at a footnote in the NAT, they say the words your kindness are not included in the Hebrew text, but have been supplied in the translation for clarity. You see, what the NAT committee is recognizing is that God is indeed, uh, Meshach is the way that uh, Leighton pronounced the Hebrew word here translated prolonged and translated helkuo in the Septuagint. These translators recognize that the direct object of that verb is not them. It's something else. And they're, they're, they're trying to find a plausible direct object for, uh, that's implied in the text. And they come up with your kindness. At least my translation came up with another uh, explicit word in the text. But again, my translation was, was of the Septuagint, not um, the Hebrew text like we're looking at here. But the point is, is that even the translators of the NET recognize that a change is indeed affected. Because kindness in their translation is the direct object of the verb. K kindness is prolonged or stretched. That's, that's affecting a change. It wasn't the people of Israel who were drawn. It was something else. Your kindness, or as I suggested might be the case for the Septuagint, many years. But it's not them. That was not a serious rebuttal. And neither will this be. Just keep that in mind. But if you know Greek at all, you might notice something already, given what I've put in contrast with it above. Notice how that in John 64, 644, him, Autan, is colored red, meaning it's, the, because, and I've colored it that way because it's the direct object of the word draws. But look what's following Helkusas in Nehemiah 9.30. Ep autus. If you are at all familiar with Greek, you will recognize ep as a shortened preposition. You see, it's not you hellcode them, it's you hellcode with them. It's a pre How does that work? How do you compel with somebody? How do you effectually draw with somebody? So is, is God getting with the people of Israel and effectually drawing, compelling with them somewhere? Again, you're not, you're, and maybe, I admit, it may be a lack of ability on my part to understand Chris, because Chris, you're at a level that I'm not at. I'm admitting ignorance here. I don't understand how you think pointing out the preposition here helps your case, that he is bearing with them, that he is um, longing with them, that he is patient with them. That seems to be a much better translation than what you go on to make the case for. 
Well, as I already said, what I was offering a translation of was the Greek, number one. Um, but number two, notice what what Leighton is suggesting here. He's suggesting that what I'm saying is because uh, the word means dragged, you know, to change effect of a position when it's being used transitively with a direct object. Therefore, it must mean, I, I must think it means dragged everywhere, even where it's not transitive with a direct object. But that's not what I was saying. The whole point I was trying to make was that if we're trying to understand what the word means in John 644, we need to look at what it means in relevant, semantically relevant um, occurrences elsewhere. And semantically relevant occurrences will be ones in which it is being used transitively with a direct object. Cases where it's not used transitively or with a direct object could mean something else. I never suggested otherwise. Now, why might... Well, in fact, here, here's the way that I put it. Um, I'm not sure if this is the video that I think it is, but we'll find out. So what we want to do is look at the semantic domain of Helco. We want to, or rather, we want to identify the semantic domain of Helco or Helco by looking at its uses in relevant literature. But there are two things that we need to um, make sure we grasp before we undertake this endeavor. Firstly, semantic domain, uh, when, when we're looking at what a word in a particular context might mean from, from amongst its semantic domain, we can't look at only the word itself. We also need to look at its um, relationship to other words in the sentence. In other words, we need to look at syntax. You see, in the phrase, the father who sent me draws him, we're not looking at just the word halkuo alone. We're looking at the word halkuo with a direct object. Him. Autan, all right? Um, if the word is used somewhere without a direct object, then its, then its use there is of ex much more limited application to its meaning here. What we, are, what we need to concern ourselves with, at least primarily, far primarily, is with uses of the word when it takes a direct object. So that's one qualification we need to keep in mind. So notice what I'm saying. I'm saying that if we've got a word that's got a semantic domain, um, and we want to find out which meanings from among its semantic domain are relevant to, uh, for, are plausible candidates for what the word might mean in a particular use, we need to look at how, like, which of the meanings within its semantic domain are used in other uh, analogous uses. I wasn't saying that that the word only has one meaning. I'm the first to say practically no words in practically any language have one meaning. Words have semantic domains. A, a semantic domain is a range of meaning, a field of meaning. And there, and there are multiple meanings within the range or within the domain. And what I'm saying is that if you've got some number greater than one of meanings within a word semantic domain and it's used in a, and that word is used in a particular way in a particular spot then to find out which of the meanings from the word semantic domain is intended in this spot you go look at relevantly analogous spots rele relevantly analogous occurrences this is the I, the idea that somehow my case requires that uh, Helkuo means drag in Nehemiah, ne Nehemiah 930 is not a serious interaction with my case. It's a foolish one. It's a haphazard one. It's, it's throwing mud at a wall just desperately hoping something sticks. Now, why might the uh, a prepositional use of a word like this be different in meaning? than a transitive one with a direct object? Well, Dan Chapa, who is in the chat right now, knows exactly why that matters. Um, and so too does his um, YouTube partner, Turretin Fan, whom I'm debating in a week. Here's, um, uh, wait, I don't, hold on. Before we get to their clip, this is this is something I was gonna play and I'll find out why. Is that if Helkuo is being used in a relevant way to what we're looking at in John 644, if it's being used in a relevant way in Nehemiah 9.30, then it's very consistent with a, an affected change of position reading 
because it's talking in some way, shape, or form about taking something that's short and making it longer. So what I was saying is that if this word is being used transitively, then whatever its meaning might, whatever the object of its of its uh, of the verb might be, it can be perfectly consistent with the way this word is used transitively everywhere else to affect a change of position. But what I'm implying, in, and I think I might have even said it explicitly there, but at the very least, I'm implying is that if it's not transitive here, it doesn't it doesn't apply. It, it, it's not part of our analysis for what it might mean in John six forty four. It could mean something else. Now I'll answer. I'll, I'll let Turton fan answer the question. Why might a prepositional use of the verb be different in meaning from a transitive one? Here is what he he explained it really well for Dan in their response to the video that Layton is responding to. There's a difference between uh, pulling on a boulder in English, pulling on a boulder, which you can do without moving the boulder, and pulling a boulder, which is a little bit ambiguous, and dragging a boulder, which is uh, which is not ambiguous, and, it's, uh, and it can't mean just pulling on the boulder. So notice what Turret and Fan is observing, and he's right. In English, the same word uh, pull with with a prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition on has a different uh, slightly or greatly meaning from when the word is used without a preposition and used transitively instead to pull a thing doesn't mean the same thing as to pull on a thing that's why we need to look at transitive uses of helkuo when we're trying to understand how it's being used in John 644, because prepositional uses of the verb can have a different meaning. Again, we're not, I don't think I'm dealing with a serious interlocutor, with a truth seeker. Let's continue. Because the Hebrew of this word, as I point out in my debate, is meshach. Let me, matter of fact, let me just put that back up on the screen. Here's Nehemiah 9.30. Remember the Septuagint the, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text. And it's literally translated, you have drawn, helko, them for many years and testified against them by, by your spirit, the hand of your prophets, and they have not listened. So even though he's helkoed with them, if you want to put it that way, even though he's prolonged many years, even if you want to put it Chris's way, they still have not listened despite God's desire for them to do this. That's the point that Chris seems to be overlooking. Now, as we discussed earlier, this was never about Leighton. This was never about his provisionism. This was not about his show. It was not about his debate. I was focusing like a laser beam on the meaning of Helkuo in John 6, and whether that word has within its semantic domain when used in relevantly analogous excuse me, uh, uh, texts, uh, whether it can mean something like invite or enable that doesn't affect a change. So the fact that I'm overlooking this point is, well, well, I'm not. It was out of scope for what I was doing. But the reason I played this clip is because he's starting to talk about the Hebrew word that is in Nehemiah 9.30, and then he goes on to make a point from another text that uses that same Hebrew word. That same Hebrew word that's used in Nehemiah 9.30 that's translated into the word helko is the word meshach, okay? And it's also used in several other texts, one of which is Hosea 11, 4 and 5, which says, I drew them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke of their jaws. Yet, it goes on, because they have refused to return to me, Okay. So he gives them over, he bends down from them, he will not return to the land of Egypt because they refuse to return to me. So even though he drew them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, they still refuse to come to him. Using the word meshach, which is exactly the same word that's used in Nehemiah 9.30 that the authors of the Septuagint, who know Greek very well, obviously, translated with the word helko. Now, first of all, as I already as I already mentioned, the Septuagint isn't merely a translation. In many places, it's an interpretation or a commentary. They take a lot of liberty, a lot of license. So the fact that they use Helkuo to translate that same Hebrew word would not in any way challenge anything I've said in the first place. But as it turns out, 
Um, this was not a serious. This was not a serious interaction with anything I said. Here's the Hebrew, the relevant part of the Hebrew of Hosea 11, 4 to 5. And notice, so it's, I led them with cords of kindness. They have refused to return to me. And that word, uh, mashak, uh, that, that um, Leighton mentioned is colored in there in red. And it's got a um, what's called a um, pronominal suffix. It's got the word them appended at the end of the word. And that's why you see the men, the sheen, and the kaf, those three characters there with some dots above and below them. That's the word. And then the maim at the end, along with the vowel under the kaf, um, is the uh, pronominal suffix meaning them. So you've got, I led them with cords of kindness, but they have refused to return to me. Now what Leighton seems to be implying is that somehow, and I say seems, see I'm not going to just say this is what he's doing. Right? I'm not going to accuse him of doing something that he may or may not be doing. I may have done that earlier and I could have gotten it wrong. But here, I'm not going to do that. It seems as if what he's implying is that God is drawing but not affecting a change. Not the case. That's not what's going on here. The drawing here, the led them, that mashak verb, that was from Egypt. It was out of Egypt. It wasn't toward God's self. It wasn't saying, I draw them to myself, but they don't come to me. No, that's not what he's saying. The drawing was from Egypt. And it was indeed effectual. In case, I mean, Leighton knows, God did indeed get get Israel out of Egypt. See, here's, here is what, here's the text in its context. Out of Egypt I called my son. I led them with cords of kindness as one who eases the yoke. This is a imagery of, of taking off the yoke that, a, that an ox is pulling. See, e- Israel was, a, was like a slave in Egypt or like, a, like a, a, a beast of burden, like an ox that's just driven around to make, to make it do, what, do stuff for Egypt. And God is here saying, I called you out of that. I led you out of that with cords of kindness as one who eases the yoke, gets the yoke off of an ox and let it go, lets it go free, that kind of concept. He did indeed affect a change of position, literally, geographically. In fact, here's Dwayne Garrett's commentary on this passage in Hosea. The text continues to reflect upon the Exodus as a type for all of Israel's future behavior. But it here changes the metaphor from Israel as a child to Israel as a draft animal or a beast of burden. Israel is an ox whose yoke God loosened and whom God gently led to the promised land, hand feeding it along the way. (laughs) This doesn't challenge my view, it only supports it. God effected a change of position for them. They were in Egypt and God took them out. And despite him him showing them that kindness, they still did not stay with him. They did not follow him, submit to him, and they were not faithful to him. It's irrelevant to, uh, well, no, it's not irrelevant. Again, to whatever extent Hosea 11, 4 to 5 is relevant, it supports an effectual reading of the verb rather than challenge it. Again, this is the kind of thing that you do when you're arguing with somebody and you're just hurrying to come up with a response as fast as possible. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll just, oh I can't be that. It's gotta be. That's not doing serious engagement on a topic. If, if he thought that there was something meaningful about the fact that the same Hebrew verb in Nehemiah 9.30 that is translated by the Septuagint Halkuo is used in Hosea 11.4-5, well then you should probably understand what Hosea 11.4-5 is saying in its context and make sure that it's supporting your case, but it doesn't. This is not a serious rebuttal. Now we're going to watch a few clips in fairly rapid succession. I'll chime in briefly after each one. Oh, I don't know why my animation stopped working. Here we go. Why? I don't know why it's doing that. Hold on. Give me one second. It was not working properly. (laughs) You're seeing, you're seeing the magic. Uh, uh, You're seeing the, what's happening underneath the surface. Anyway. All right, now is it going to work? We've got Antiquities of the Jews 545, drew them a great way. Now it's done psychologically, right? Um, the, the person in view here pretends to retreat. 
And it is because they uh, pretend to retreat that the attacking army is drawn away. They, they follow after the person who pretends to retreat. But just because it's not done via force doesn't mean it doesn't affect the change of position. It does. That's the whole point of this text. He well, well, that's because it worked, Chris. <laughs> what if the general in the other army saw what the people were doing and said, hey, they're retreating, but they that's because they want us to, to, to follow them. And so we're not going to do that. Then, then the text would say they purposed to draw them or they tried to draw them or they wanted to draw them but did not that's exactly right he literally just said my point had the had they failed to do what they tried to do namely draw them the text would have said they tried to but did not draw they tried to draw them but did not draw them you're just proving my point you can try to draw and your attempt could fail, in which case you have not drawn. Nobody has been drawn. But if you draw them, your, your attempt was successful. Had you been unsuccessful, it would have said, by your own words, Leighton, you would have, would have said tried to draw but did not draw. This is not a serious interaction, but there's more. Now, here's the thing. If you look in this text, um, he doesn't actually succeed. But notice it doesn't say, if I'm remembering correctly, okay. anyway, notice it doesn't say he enticed Antony to hedonism, but, but Antony didn't reply. No, it says he intended to entice Antony to hedonism, but failed. Okay, this is when you've unfalsified your view, because the same word is used when the enticement works, like in the first example there, as it is when it doesn't work, the second example there, because he purposes to entice. The, the army purposed to entice them. In the first one, it worked, and the word Helco is used. In the second one, it didn't work, and the same word is used, Helco. And yet he still claims that it can't be used to support the concept and idea of God drawing people and it not effectuating a decision. That's right, because although the word draw is used, it's tried to draw, purposed to draw, attempted to draw, sought to draw, but not drew. I didn't falsify my own position. I just, you just falsified your own view. If the attempt fails, they did not draw. They attempted to draw, but they did not draw, they failed. So the fact that the word is still used is irrelevant because it's being used after the words tried to, attempted to, purposed to. You can try to draw and fail, in which case you did not draw, or you can try to draw and succeed, in which case you did draw, but you can't draw and fail to draw. That's kind of the whole point. Had he succeeded, then Antony would have been enticed, but he didn't, so he wasn't enticed. He wasn't Helku owed. He wasn't Helk owed. No, he was, he was, but it failed. He purposed to entice him. He tried to entice him, but Anthony refused, okay? That's right. He tried to Helko him, but failed. What he didn't do is Helko him. You can try to Helko and fail, in which case they aren't Hellcode. Or you can try to Helco and succeed, and they are Hellcode, but you can't you can't Helco somebody and not Helco somebody. You can't Helco somebody and fail to Helco somebody. This is not a serious interaction. What does that tell you? Well, what if God is purposing to draw the world to himself? But many resisted. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me tries to draw him? No. The text doesn't say tries to draw. It says draws. Now, that doesn't mean that this text doesn't envision in some unstated way 
an attempt to draw that may fail. I even conceded that at the end of the video. I said what my conclusions here do not prove Calvinism true or my reading correct. And then in my engagements with Dan Chapa, who's in the, or at least earlier was in the chat, and with Turretin Fan, I conceded that there may be a way to reconcile this text with a non-Calvinist reading, and yet recognize that if it's if somebody's drawn, they've the uh, change of position has been affected. So I'm not I'm not saying this somehow proves a Calvinist reading. Thank you, Dan. Good to hear. But what I am saying is that the text nowhere says unless the Father who sent me tries to draw him. It says draws. So this wasn't a meaningful, a, a serious interaction. You see the point? God may have a purpose to draw the world to himself, not when Christ is still on earth, but only after he accomplishes his purpose through the resurrection and he's raised up, then he will draw all men to himself. Do you notice how Leighton you're shifting the goalposts back and forth. You're you're saying purpose to draw, purpose to draw, try to draw, try, try to draw, and then you quote John 12 and say, will draw all to myself. You're trying to eat your cake and have it too. Trying to draw is not the same thing as drawing. Drawing is what happens when the trying to draw is successful. So sure, perhaps God is trying to draw all. And perhaps he succeeds with some of them. Maybe. But that's not what John 6 says. It has to be, there. it must be unstated underneath the covers, underneath the surface. Um, and it runs right up into a problem with John 12. Because John 12 also does not say try to draw. Jesus does not say that when I am lifted up from the earth, I will try to draw all people to myself. It says, I will draw all people to myself. And because helkuo means to affect the change of position when it's being used transitively with a direct object, which is what all here is, it, it, therefore, Jesus, whatever Jesus is trying to, whatever attempt Jesus is making to draw here succeeds for all. Now, in my video, I pointed out that if a non-Calvinist wants to concede my case about what Helkuo means, but still say it could uh, that they can make sense of John six forty four, well, then they've got what I argued in my um, my show from two episodes ago, from four weeks ago, is that they then have to concede a point that we Calvinists make about the word all in John twelve thirty two, and Leighton attempts. A rebuttal, but as we'll see, it was not a serious rebuttal. If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now, I, I don't have a clip of it, but Chris does um, address this argument, and he addresses my argument against the concept and idea that this would promote universalism if the word draw is taken uh, to mean all without exception, okay? Um, every single person. And he makes the case to say this is actually drawing all types or all kinds of people. Um, and we, we would just push back against that, reminding people that it even can mean all without distinction to some degree, okay? Um, we can understand that it means it can mean all without distinction to, in some regard. But that just because something is all without distinction doesn't mean it's also all without, it, it's not all without exception. So he's saying, he's saying that just because it's all without distinction doesn't mean it's not also all without exception. What he's implying, or what it seems I should say he's implying, is that if it's all without distinction, then it is all without exception as well. But what I showed in the video that he's responding to is that the lexicons offer those as two different meanings. Every single one of versus every kind of. Lonita offers a couple of texts as an example in which it means every kind, but not every single. One of those examples is Matthew 4.23, where Jesus goes throughout all Galilee, healing every disease and every affliction. The word is pas there, meaning all or every, 
But Jesus did not heal every single ailment without exception. There was, we have, if he was healing every single ailment that he encountered, every single thumbnail or, 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 or hangnail, every single cold, every single flu, every single broken limb, every single uh, uh, maimed limb, whatever, there, Jesus would never have had any time to do the rest of his ministry. Here is one example by the lexicon's own admission where pas, meaning every, does not mean every single, it means every kind. It does not mean without exception, but it does mean without distinction. He healed every kind of ailment without distinction. And then, of course, we could talk about what kinds of ailments, what categories of ailments there must be, but that's beside the point. He did not heal every disease and every affliction without exception. Black the BDAG is an, is an ex, also has as a second definition everything belonging in kind. And it offers another example of a text where it means that. Romans 7 8. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Now, guess what? All kinds is not my me, my translation. It's the NASB. It's the NIV. It's the ESV. I, f I forgot to mention that it's the ESV here. It's the NLT. It's the RSV. It's the NRSV. It's the KJV. It's the NKJV. It's the CSB. It's the HDSB. It's the LEB. It's the NET. It's the ASV. It's the DRB. It's the JNT. JNT, by the way, is Jewish New Testament, D done by David Stern. DRB is the Do 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 Rames Bible, something like that. ASV is the American Standard Version. LEB is the Lexham English Bible. It's done by the makers of Logos Bible Software. But anyway, the point is virtually every major translation says all kinds here. But guess what? And, and, but there is no separate word for kinds. It's translating the single word, pas. Not a single, no single person in history has every single envy without exception. If you had somebody who literally had every imaginable envy, every imaginable covetousness, they wouldn't be able to function. They'd be envying their neighbor's yard, their dog, their truck, their car, their TV, their wife, their kids, their home, their their job. They'd be they their every waking moment of their life and every moment of their dreaming life would be consumed with envy. No, this isn't all without exception at all. But it is all without distinction. Every kind of covetousness, every kind of envy is produced in me, in me by the command not to covet. This was not a serious rebuttal, and neither will the following be. As we've talked about before, um, if, if you have uh, people in the land, a uh, sheriff comes to a new town, and the elite, the upper class, are, are saying, you know, are getting away with breaking laws because they have all the money. Uh, and the new sheriff in town comes in and he addresses this thing, this problem happen, happening. And he makes a statement. Every single person is subject to the laws of the land. Now, is he addressing all without distinction? Of course he is. That's exactly what he's talking about. All without distinction are subject to the law of the land. Now, suppose somebody's stepping in and saying, oh, what he means, therefore, because he's addressing all classes of people, rich and poor classes, because he's addressing that. Therefore, what he really means is some, a few of all kinds of people are subject to the laws of the land. That's what he really means because he's addressing all without distinction. No, obviously the context of that, that quote, that every single person is under the subject, is subject to the law of the land, addressing the concept and idea that the upper class don't think they're subject to the laws of the land, still incorporates within that statement that every single person without exception is subject to the law of the land regardless of their class. So there are two really obvious glaring problems with that rebuttal that proves it's not a serious one. First of all, what we're observing about the word pas in John 12, 32, doesn't mean that all means a few of every kind of. What we're if it's all without if it's every or all without distinction number is not a is not even in mind. The percentage of every kind isn't even in view. 
So to smuggle in the word few as if somehow that's what he must mean if we are right is just foolish. It's certainly not serious. But more to the point, here again, Leighton is shifting the goalposts. He's alleging, he, he's offering his story about the sheriff as if it proves that all without distinction implies all without dis, uh, exception. And yet he used the phrase every single person. Well, of course, if the sheriff says every single person, then all without distinction would also mean all without exception, except it's not the all without distinction that means it. It's the fact that the phrase is every single person. And had Jesus in John 12, 32 said, I will draw every single person to myself. And if it's in the context of all kinds, then yeah, it would mean uh, all without distinction and all without exception. Of course, then it would also go to universalism, but we're not universalists. And that's because the Bible doesn't even come close to teaching universalism. But anyway, but notice no translation of John 12, 32 says, we'll draw every single person to myself. It's draw all. Now, not only is there no anthropos there, meaning person, or any other word that all modifies, but also, in other words, it's just all. I will draw all to myself. But moreover, the word, the form of the word pas here is pantas, which is plural. This is all people, not every single person. Now, here is a quote from an article in Time magazine. I've got the link listed there, so you can go look it up in its context for yourself. This is by um, a uh, recording artist by the name of Harry Belafonte. You can go look this up yourself. It's uh, it's an article um, praising a, a black woman named Stacey Abrams. The inordinate strength, he says, revealed by black people in America in their capacity to survive the harsh political journey they experience in this country is in large part due to the fortitude of black women. Not just black women, but all people have been the beneficiaries of this gift of survival in the name of truth and solidarity. Now guess what? Harry Belafonte is not saying that every single person who has ever lived since this, uh, since the founding of America or something like that has been benefited by this. It's every kind of person has benefited from this survival ability on the part of black people. He's using the phrase all people to mean every kind of person. And, and, and we know that because of the way he structures it, not just black women, but all people. Not just one kind, but all kinds, which is exactly the context of John 12. Here's another quote. This is from Miroslav. I'm not even going to try to pronounce, pronounce his last name. Um, he is a, or was a, uh, I don't know if he still is, um, a leading official in the United Nations. And this is him. This is a quote from his opening remarks at the 2018 United Nations Youth Dialogue. Again, links on the screen. If the United Nations is to meet the goals set for itself in the UN Charter, it needs to engage with people. It needs to bring people inside of this building, the, the UN building. It needs to talk to people and reach out to people, and not just some people, not just people of a certain profession, certain rank, or certain age, but all people. Miroslav is not talking about every single person on the planet. Every single person on the planet couldn't fit inside the building in the first place. And even if one wants to say that the all people is in reference to the people that the UN needs to talk to and reach out to, even there, there's no way that the UN could even conceivably talk to every single person in existence. Miroslav is saying not just this kind of person, not just this kind of person, not just this kind of person, but all kinds of persons. So the fact that it's all people and not every single person in John 12 makes the not the the all without distinction reading make a lot of sense. It's even the way that we use English, at least sometimes. And if you offer an analogy in which the sheriff says every single person, you're not seriously engaging. 
and so too everyone will be drawn regardless of their class. And when you were use the word cosmos to connote this, you're certainly including a more inclusive or wider range of idea. It certainly doesn't mean a few of all kinds. Well, once again, the all kinds meaning doesn't assume any sort of number. So this, it certainly doesn't mean a few of all kinds is just foolish mud throwing at the wall, hoping a little bit sticks. It's not serious. But what about this claim that the word cosmos in John 12 somehow tells us that this is in fact every single person without distinction? Well, here's the text of John 12, 32, kago eon, um, Hupsotho ek tes geis pantas helkuso pras hemautan, emautan. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Do you know what you didn't hear there? You didn't hear there anything about a cosmos, anything about a world. Now, that doesn't mean that world isn't in John 12. It is, but it's not in verse 32. Where it is, is in verse 31. Nun crisis est tin tu cosmu tu tu. Now is the judgment of this world. Nun ha archon tu cosmu tu tu ek ble thesatai exo. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. World here isn't the all people Jesus draws. World is everybody, is the world being judged? The judgment of everybody on earth, arguably, or the judgment of the wicked among them? But verse 32 is a contrast. It's an adversative use of kago, meaning and I. Now is the judgment of this world, but when I'm lifted up, I will draw all kinds of people to myself. The fact that world is used in verse 31 has no bearing whatsoever on all in verse 32. And all it takes is actually reading verse 31 to see it. This was not a serious rebuttal. The world is drawn, or sorry, the world is judged, not drawn. And it says noon, twice, now. The world at that time was witnessing its judgment. And that included all kinds of people, but not every single person on earth. This was not a serious rebuttal. So that is all the clips that that's been all the clips that I prepared to respond to. And I really think it, those clips and my responses to them establish what I said at the beginning, that although it grieves me that what I said hurts Leighton, I'll stand by it. Leighton, you are not a truth seeker on this topic. You are a provisionism defender. A provisionism defender at all costs. Whatever whatever mud I can throw at the wall, whatever pancake batter I can splatter at the map in order, I'm going to do so and hope that some of it lands in the right spots. You didn't. You don't make any meaningful uh, attempt, any serious attempt to understand and meaningfully rebut or respond to our arguments or even our views. That is my assessment of you, Leighton, on this topic. And like I said in that clip earlier, this is not um, to say that you're a bad person. It's not to say that you're a bad scholar. It's just to say that my assessment is that when it comes to this topic, the topic of Calvinism, you are not a truth seeker. You are a provisionism defender, and you will defend it with whatever can pancake, platter, uh, pancake batter you can throw at the wall. And I think this demonstrate this response is demonstrated as much. But here's the thing: I've got a little bit of an addendum. The, uh, we'll be done in like ten minutes. We're almost done. I'm amazed that I've gotten through it this fast. We're going to need to return to this diagram for a moment because I discovered something literally just today in the hours leading up to streaming this. So this is a little bit of a bonus, but it's a relevant one as you'll see. So what happened a few hours before this stream uh, is that I noticed I got. Well, okay, hold on. What we're going to cover here, though, is not the use of the word helkuo. We're going to be looking at the use of the word exelko. Because this word is a compound of the preposition ek, meaning from, and the word helkuo or helko that we've been talking about, meaning draw. 
And the and what alerted me to the existence of this word was a comment on my YouTube video, one of my YouTube videos that read as follows. And it was like just this morning that I saw this um, and then investigated it in the hours leading up to this stream. Mr. Date, this commentator says on my YouTube video, if you look at James 1.14 and he quotes it and he points out the word Exelco, he says, so if you choose to claim that Helco only and always means dragged, then the lusts of a man must also and always mean that if a man has any sort of lust, then he cannot ever resist them. But 24 7 365, that, mass, that man must only sin in every waking moment. And he goes on to say that, um, that not even, no Calvinist believes that. And I was like, well, this is interesting. I'm going to check this out. Now, before I show you my findings, I should point out that because this is a compound word um, that combines a preposition with helkuo, doesn't mean that helkuo by itself has the same meaning as helkuo as part of the compound verb, verb, verb exelko. As soon as you modify a word by making a compound word out of it, the meaning can change. And so, even if what I was about to show you weren't true, it wouldn't in any way challenge the meaning of Helkuo or Helko in the places that it's used. But as it turns out, Hexelko just means the same thing as Helkuo, with a little tiny bit of nuance provided by the preposition. So let's look at two of these layers. I didn't have time before the stream to look in uh, Josephus or Philo. It doesn't appear anywhere in John, but it is used once elsewhere in the New Testament here in James, and then a few times in the Septuagint. So let's look at James 1.14. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And you'll recognize this table from the episode two episodes ago. I've got the verse on the left, the text in the middle, and a question mark on the right column. Was this effectual? The commentator on my YouTube video is saying, no, it couldn't be effectual, because if it does mean to affect a change of position, then everybody, when they're tempted, must give, must give in to their sin. All right. So here's James 1.14 in a few translations. This is the ESV. Each person is tempted when he is lured. Now, the reason I've got all of when he is lured colored black and not just the word lured is because this is actually a preposi or a, 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 sorry, a, a, a participle. Literally, each person is tempted being lured and being enticed by his own desire. So there is no when here. It's, it's a part of the participial form of the word translated lured, which in this case is exelco. Uh, exelco, exelco. But there are other translations. The NIV says each person is tempted when they are dragged away <laughs> by their own evil desire and enticed. And it's not just the NIV. The New Living Translation, NLT, the LEB, the Lexham English Bible, and the JNT, the Jewish New Testament, they all also use dragged away or dragged off. And the King James and New King James, the, the HCSB and the CSB and the ASV all use drawn away. All these translations on the bottom here see it as an affected change of position. Well, what is going on here then? Well, here's a few commentators. Here's Peter H. Davids, the New International Greek Testament comment commentary. James in the first word, lures or exelco, pictures the person enticed to a hook and drawn out like a fishing, like a fishing line. And in the second, the person is attracted to a trap by delicious bait. So what Peter Davids here is saying is that lures and enticed are like two different word pictures. Lures has to do with drawing a fish out of the water. Um, enticed has to do with bait in a trap. That's one way that it's been understood, but notice the, the exelco is effectual. It is affecting a change of position. Ralph Martin in the Word Biblical Commentary says, Desire is personified as a force that draws out a victim by luring him as fish are lured and baited. So the sense is drawn out and enticed. Another commentator acknowledging that the word is effectual here. Here's Douglas Moo, and of course, I shouldn't say of course, my suspicion is that Leighton would look at a, commenta a commentary like this and say, well, of course, this commentator is going to say it. He's a Calvinist. Well, he's also um, a very well-respected scholar. And what he points out here is that James used, and, and by the way, this text has nothing to do with Calvinism anyway. 
So I don't know why his being a Calvinist would bias him here. But anyway, he writes in his commentary on James, James uses metaphorical language to convey the mode of operation of the evil desire. Temptation arises when a person is dragged away and enticed. The metaphor comes from fishing. The bait on the fisherman's hook would entice the fish, and once hooked, the fish would be dragged away. So unlike the first of the th commentators we've looked at so far, Moo is saying this isn't two different word pictures, it's one. The enticing is is putting is having bait on a hook that is in, that is enticing fish in, and the exelco is pulling them out of the water. But it is but that exelco is affecting a change of position. But there's still another commentator worth looking at, Scott McKnight, from ten years ago, his New International Commentary on the New Testament, um, the Letter of James. The order, he, he points out that that order of sequence that Mu proposes, that, you know, it's, it's enticed by bait and then it's drawn out like a, like a fishing line. It does not satisfying in that way because it looks like it's backward, right? To be drawn out as if by a hook and then to be aroused by the bait seems backward. And so Scott McKnight suggests that instead of seeing a process here, Perhaps we should see two images, and he goes back to something, uh, uh, two alternate readings, kind of like the first commentator we looked at. In the first, the human is lured onto a hook and dragged to the ground by desire, while in the second, the person is enticed by desires. Again, this commentator, who I have no reason to assume is a Calvinist, in fact, I, for some reason, my inclination is to say that Scott McKnight is Wesleyan, but I could be wrong about that. But he's still acknowledging that Exelco is, in fact, effectual. It does affect the change of position. So why do the NIV, the NLT, the LEB, the JNT, the N New King James, the King James, the HCSB, the CSB, and the ASV, why do they all use dragged away or drawn away? Does that somehow mean that any time somebody is tempted, they are they they are uh, uh, they affect uh, 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 a change of uh, position to sin is effectuated? No. See, James doesn't have in mind only the temptation. He also has in mind the whole process that begins with the temptation. The process of then giving into the temptation like uh, one is drawn by, like, like one drawn by a hook. As one is drawn to the next stage, the, the stage of sinning, by one's sinful desires. So in the one place in the New Testament where exelco is used, this compound verb that includes helkuo or helko in its root, it also means to affect a change of position. So in the rest of the in in the one place it's used, it does mean to affect a change of position. And by the way, there's no other word that I was able to find in the New Testament that that you that comes from the root helkuo or helko. This was the only one. Now, in the Septuagint, which is the only other body of literature I had a chance to look at before today's stream, Exelco appears several times. Genesis 37 to 28, this is the story of, the, um, of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brothers throw him into a pit, and then they pull him out to, to give him to traders, to slave traders as they're passing by. They drew Exelco and lifted Joseph out of the pit. Yes, it was effectual. Judges 20.31, the children of Benjamin were all drawn out of the city. Now, I'm marking, like I did in the first video, I'm marking this as not applicable because it's not a transitive use with a direct object. This is that, this is that thing where the subject is the subject of a passive verb. So you could convert the passive verb into an active one and make the subject the object, but... I'm saying we probably want to be careful and not assume that applies from the market is not applicable, but I put the asterisk there because if we did do that conversion, it would effectuate a change of position. Third Maccabees 2.23, his friends and bodyguards speedily removed him, took him out. And not took him out in the sense of killing him. They were afraid that their person they're protecting might die, so they get him out of Dodge. They affected a change of position. Proverbs 30, 33. If you drag out reasonings, disputes and contentions will issue forth. Now this one's a little bit curious, but it looks like what's going on is if you prolong the process of reasoning uh, to an unjustified, indefinite degree, then what will come forth are all sorts of disputes and contentions. I think that's what's going on, but either way, you've got 
a, a change of position affected, a change affected. Job 2015, a messenger shall drag him out of his house. A change of position is affected. Job 36:20, draw not for draw not forth or don't draw forth all the mighty by night so that the people should go up instead of them. See in context what's going on here is uh, somebody is saying uh, don't you know give justice to the needy to the poor to the oppressed and the mighty are the oppressors here and what he's saying is don't in the middle of the night take out the people who are be awaiting trial or whatever um who are the mighty ones don't sneak them away so they don't have to face justice and then the people that were oppressed have to go up instead of them at least that's how i read it but either way they are in fact drawing forth uh, or, or or the dragging is assumed to be effectual it's just he's saying don't do it so everywhere in the septuagint this is all six uses everywhere in the septuagint that exelco this compound verb that combines the preposition ek with the verb helku or helco every single one of them where it's semantically relevant because it's transitive with a direct object it affects a change of position and even in the one place where it is a passive verb that a subject is experiencing if you were to convert that to an active verb acting on an object it would be effectual too <coughs> and guess what these are persons This was not a meaningful rebuttal, and even in the uh, prompted by the non-Calvinist um, commentator on my or commenter on my YouTube video, when it when that prompts when they think they've caught me in something, and I go and I look into it because here's the thing again I want I am a truth seeker or at least I'm trying to be like I we're all biased to one degree or another and anybody can say they're a truth seeker it doesn't mean they are. But as evidence that I'm a true seeker, what I'm offering is I've gone and looked at every single use of the word that that comment commenter on my YouTube video mentioned. I did the legwork. I didn't assume anything. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't simply take commentators at their face value. I didn't just, you know, I I I looked at every use of the word. I looked at commentators. I looked at them in the context. I looked at every use of the word in the Septuagint, etc. So I tested the the, the rebuttal very carefully because i'm looking for the truth and yeah i'll be honest if i'd found a use of that word exelco exelco that that didn't mean affect a change of position that just meant try to affect a change of position that would have been curious and i would have had to have uh, dealt with that and either like i said what i think i probably would have said is that is less applicable to understanding what helco means since it's not helco by itself it's a compound but as it turns out, it does mean to affect the change of position. So I think, and yes, you know, Leighton made a big deal in his response about how I must have spent hours preparing. And you know what? I do. I probably put a solid 12 hours into these presentations that I give you very often. It certainly did with the video he responded to and did in this case as well. The reason I do that is because I'm trying to seek the truth, and if I'm wrong, I want to know it. So when somebody rebuts me, when somebody offers an argument, I I really carefully consider it, and I test it. But what did we see in all the clips from Leighton that we saw today and responded to? He doesn't try really to understand, let alone really meaningfully engage in the argument, and that's why I don't think he's a serious interlocutor on this topic. So that's what I've had for you today. I hope it's been helpful. I hope that Leighton takes this in the spirit that it's intended. Um, I love you, Leighton. And I don't want to hurt you by calling you not serious. But yeah, I don't think that you're serious. Anyway, as I said, a week from today, uh, when I would normally be streaming Rethinking Hell Live, I will instead be doing a live debate on Marlon Wilson's The Gospel Truth YouTube channel to have a debate with Turretin Fan, the pseudonymous blogger that I've interacted with on the topic of hell in the past. We'll be debating the nature and duration of hell. Uh, 
And what I'm planning on doing is pre-recording an episode of Rethinking Hell Live and playing it at that time. Um, so you can choose whether you want to watch a live debate or watch an episode of Rethinking Hell Live and then go watch the other one um, after it's been archived. Uh, and then two weeks from today uh, will be Monday, May 30th at 6 p.m. Pacific, and I'll be back here at that usual day and time. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Leighton, if you watched this. I hope this has been helpful. I would say I'm looking forward to Leighton's response, but I'll be honest, I'm not. Um, but we'll see what happens when it comes. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Please do all the YouTube stuff. You know, like, subscribe. Click notifications bell, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. I've been your host, Chris Date, and thanks so much for watching The Apologetics, where we think together through what we believe, why we believe it, and not something else. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up, like icon, the subscribe button, and the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are streamed or uploaded. Either way, come back in two weeks for the next episode of The Apologetics, streaming live on YouTube every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until then...